David will give this message, and then at 10.30, uh, Alan will give his message. Once that's over, we're inviting everybody to please come downstairs. We have leftover food, so there's no need to eat anywhere else. We have plenty. I was able to get a sheet if you need to put your, if you have a new address or you have never given it to us to get on a mailing list for the future conferences. There's a paper on the back table right there next to the uh, offering place. Please give us your, at least your name and address. If you have an email that you would like to share, put that on there as well. The offer plate, is, of course, we don't pass it. Uh, it's back there if you want to get to the church. Today is what we'll go towards the church. Yesterday was to Grace School of the Bible. If there is something you want to give to Grace School of the Bible and you miss, if you want to, we can get it to them. Just let us know. So with that, we'll have Ed come and be sent.
Bible Church, we have a YouTube page, that these messages will be there. Dispensational Bible Church. So, uh, and also, Morris is the number up here, 217-497-4011. Call Lila Bay, right there. Call Lila Bay. He will get to you at later on. We good, Edward? Alan, Natalie, thank you for the great music. Uh, just a couple things before we jump in. I um, want to thank Alan and Lisa for their hospitality every year. Every year we come in, make a big mess, a bunch of commotion, but they're very, very patient people, and they endure it with great, great humility, so we appreciate that. want to thank Ed for the super job recording, 
and then want to thank Morris and the Saints for drawing a great conference. We thank you for the, the privilege, the opportunity to be here. So we really value it. So with that, let me open us in a word of prayer, and we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to, to get together and spend time studying it. Uh, we thank you that we can do so freely. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll offer one thing as a thought. Um, turn with me to Genesis 14, and I'll offer this as a thought. The, um, this Bible conference is an example of what America should be, right? Small church, people involved in studying the Word can meet freely. There's no, there's no frills. There's no, you know, it, it's not about making a fair show in the flesh. It's about the heartland of America getting together in, in, in liberty and good conscience studying the scriptures. So I find it rejuvenating, and, you know, thank you for, the, for hosting it. The topic I want to take up this morning is the question of who is Melchizedek? Many years ago, uh, we had a Bible study, and uh, what would happen is this one guy would come, and he'd ask, who is Melchizedek? And I'd answer it, and then he'd come back the next week, and he'd, answer, he'd ask the same question again. And, and, and he kept doing that, and... He must not have been persuaded of my answer because he just kept asking the same question. And I'm finally going, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't tell you anything beyond what I've told you. That's all I know. Um, so we'll, let, let's spend some time studying it together today. So the question we're going to look at is, who is Melchizedek? Now, just a, a, an, a, a, you know, a brief word about how to think through this. How do you study things for yourself? So if you were pondering in your own mind, who is Melchizedek? What, what would you do to study it? How would you think about that? And what I'm going to suggest, the answer is actually really simple, right? You get a concordance or you get the Blue Letter Bible, whichever, you know, that's a modern tool, and you just read every single verse, right? You read every single verse, you look at the relevant cross-references, and uh, I think Morris would agree with this. Uh, the key to, to Bible understanding is not genius, it's perseverance, Right? It's looking at verse after verse, cross-reference after cross-reference. The Bible will tell you what it wants you to know. You just have to be patient to dig into it to find it. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at every verse that deals with Melchizedek. There, there are two mentions of him. Uh, well, let's just start in Genesis 14. We'll start there. there the, Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek... King of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So let's just take apart this verse just for a minute. So the first thing we notice about Melchizedek, as we go through these verses, if you would, just keep a mental list of all the facts that you're told, because all those facts are going to they're gonna lead you to a conclusion, I would suggest. So Melchizedek, the first thing we know about him is he's the king of Salem. And then we're also told in this verse that he's the priest of the Most High God. Look with me at verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now what's interesting in verse 19 is Melchizedek says, blessed be Abram of the Most High God. And so he blesses Abram and makes reference to the Most High God. Some read into that, well, this can't be God that's doing it, because he blesses Abram in the name of the Most High God. So just keep that in the back of your mind for the moment. And then in verse 20, and it says, and he gave him tithes at all. When you, when you read that, it's not entirely clear who the he is who's paying the tithes. It's a little bit ambiguous. So keep that in the back of your mind because we're going to look at some cross-references and we'll see if those give us clarity. Get Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord... Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So who's the lowercase l-o-r-d in this? Capital L, then lowercase o-r-d. Who is that? Jesus Christ, right? 
the, the all caps Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of youth. Now notice verse 4. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou, the thou here in verse 4 is the same thou in verse 1. It's Jesus Christ. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, apparently, Jesus Christ is a priest, and he is a priest of what order? After the order of Melchizedek. Now, those two passages are the only two Old Testament passages that deal with Melchizedek, but there's a bunch in the New Testament, so go with me to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. Hebrews 5, 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Now verse 5 is very clear that it's talking about Jesus Christ because it mentions him by name, doesn't it? So also Christ glorified not himself. Verse 5 ends with, Thou art my capital S son. So it's pretty clear that's Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 6. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Hebrews 5, 6 is quoting Psalm 110. So if you had any doubt in Psalm 110 about who the thou was that's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, it's pretty clear from Hebrews 5, isn't it? The Hebrews 5, verse 6 makes it clear that it's Jesus Christ who is the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Notice chapter 5, verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that's saying something similar to verse 6. I include that just because what we're going to do is we're going to look at each each of these verses. The right way to do something is you just go through all of them, right? You don't want to just pick a couple that you like. Hebrews 6, verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So again, clear that Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now we're going to go to chapter 7. And this is probably the most extensive chapter, well it is, in the scripture that deals with who Melchizedek is. So verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed him. Verse 2. Now, by the way, who did the blessing there? Melchizedek blessed Abram, right? Verse 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. Now, notice this part. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So a couple things are clarified by verse 2. The first is, who was it that paid the tithes? Was it Melchizedek or was it Abraham? Abraham paid the tithes. So that's interesting. The next thing that's, that's, that we learn in verse 2 is, what does Melchizedek mean by interpretation? King of righteousness. Now I'm going to suggest to you that narrows down considerably who Melchizedek is, right? There's not a lot of of options on that. So he's the king of righteousness. Now keep Hebrews 7, but get Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23, and let's look at verse 5. 
Jeremiah 23, I believe, helps you understand what king of righteousness is a reference to. Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a capital K king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So according to Jeremiah 23, who, who's the righteous branch? It's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? And so, go back with me to Hebrews chapter 2. When Hebrews 2 tells you that the, the term Melchizedek means king of righteousness, I personally think that's a great clue as to who it's referring to. And then after that, it says also king of Salem, and the king of Salem means what? King of, king of peace. Look with me at, in Hebrews 7, look with me at verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, so it has no descendants, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the capital S Son of capital G God, abideth a priest continually. Now if you look at verse 3, you, you, you probably already have, you know, it's probably not a secret who Melchizedek is, is it? <laughs> There's not a lot of options. So if you notice verse 3, without father, without mother, so in other words, had to have been a pre-existent being, right? He wasn't generated by something else. Without descent, and then notice having neither beginning of days. So doesn't that limit it rather? I mean, does, does Satan have a beginning of days? Does every angel have a beginning of days? Yeah, every... So it has to be a non-created being. Now look at the last, near the last part of that verse. Made like unto the capital S Son of capital G God. What that might remind you of, keep Hebrews 7, but get Daniel 3. Daniel chapter 3. So what Hebrews 7 does is it tells you that this Melchizedek, it, it makes the direct comparison that he's made like unto the capital S son of capital G God. Daniel 3.25. Now, Daniel 3, as you recall, is, the, is the, the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Notice with me verse 25. He answered and said, this is Nebuchadnezzar, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, hey guys, how incompetent are you? <laughs> I'm looking at this fire and I see four guys in there and I only told you to throw three in. So what happened? Right? That's what he's saying. Why are there four there? Now notice this. And the form of the fourth is like what? The Son of God. Now, in, in your Bibles, does it, does, is Son spelled with a capital S? Yes. And God is spelled with a capital G, isn't it? I'm going to read to you from the NIV in Daniel 3.25. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a lowercase s son of the lowercase g gods, plural. Now you've been told at some point that the modern versions say the same thing as the King James Bible, they just got rid of thee and thou, right? They got rid of the archaic words, but otherwise it means the same thing. So I ask you, is the capital S Son of capital G God the same thing as a Son of the gods? The meaning is different, isn't it? See, what Daniel 3.25 is telling you, and this is fascinating, this is Nebuchadnezzar, right? Nebuchadnezzar is the king that's struck with lycanthropy. He runs out into the wilderness and eats grass like an ox, right? He's not exactly a mid ax dispensationalist, right? But he's looking at the fire. He sees the fourth, and what does he say? 
it looks like the Son of God. In other words, it doesn't look like some random person. It looks like the capital S Son of capital G God. In other words, God in human flesh. The NIV changes that, and it changes in a way, in my opinion, that obscures what's really going on in that passage. So my encouragement to you is this. Go back to Hebrews 7 just for a minute. When Hebrews 7 there says, but made like unto the Son of God, isn't that a rather clear cross-reference to Daniel 3.25? And in Daniel 3.25, my encouragement to you, it seems to me when it says, made like unto the capital S Son of capital G God, the first thing that goes through my mind is I know who that is, right? That's Jesus Christ. So what you're seeing in Daniel 3.25, I believe, is you're seeing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. They have no hurt. They suffer no damage. For what reason? Well, there's someone there with them that invented fire and could control it. I mean, it's obvious. Isn't that what's going on? So then once you understand Daniel 3.25 is a reference to Jesus Christ being in the fire, and then Hebrews 7.3 talks about Melchizedek, and it says that he is made like unto the capital S, son of capital G, God, I think it tells you who it is. So what that, what that means, I'm going to do a little writing on the board here. Uh, what that means is this. The word there is Christophany. It's similar to the word theophany. And what it means is it is a manifestation, a revealing of, guess who? Jesus Christ. And so what I would suggest to you is happening in Daniel 3.25 is it's a revelation. It is a manifestation of Jesus Christ. And if that's what Daniel 3.25 is, what did Hebrews 7 just tell you about Melchizedek. Same thing, isn't it? So you're in Hebrews 7. Look with me at verse 4. Now consider how great this, notice the word here, man was. So it's going to describe Melchizedek as a man. Hmm. Do you know anyone throughout history that was described as both a god and a man? You can think about it for a while. You might come up with something. Isn't that what's going on? Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Now notice verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them that receive tithes of Abraham. So think about that carefully. Isn't that fascinating? He whose descent is not counted from them that receive tithes of Abraham. In verse 5, which tribe in Israel is, uh, is referenced? Levi. Levi. What tribe is the Lord from? Judah. Judah. So isn't that elegant? Jesus Christ needed not to be a descendant of Levi because he wasn't going to be part of the Levitical priesthood. What, part of the, what priesthood is he a part of? After the order of Melchizedek. What a quinky dink. Look with me at verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. What that tells you is, if the less is blessed of the better, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham, then Melchizedek has to be greater than Abraham. Which, of course, we know that he was. Verse 8. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them. Who received the tithe? Melchizedek, right? He received them, notice this, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Now, have you ever seen anyone testify Melchizedek lives? 
No. But is there testimony in the scriptures about someone else living? Get with me Acts chapter 1. We're going to come back to Hebrews 7, but get Acts 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 22. Acts chapter 1, verse 22. Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of what? His resurrection. Being a witness of his resurrection is testifying that Jesus Christ lives, isn't it? Look with me at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Chapter 3, verse 15. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Acts 4, verse 33. Acts 4, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of what? Of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So go back with me to Hebrews 7 for a minute. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. So let's read this again. And here men that die, that's part of the Levitical priesthood, receive tithes. But there he received them of whom... It is witnessed that he liveth. Well, that, that's obviously Jesus Christ, isn't it? I mean, when the New Testament talks about witnessing that someone lives, it's talking about witnessing to the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Hebrews 7, verse 9. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met, met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Get verse 15. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Verse 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest of forever after the order of Melchizedek. Go to verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now based upon Psalm 110 and Hebrews 6.20, that's obviously a reference to the Jesus, Jesus Christ. Get verse 24. Notice this. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So let me list together for you all the things we've learned about Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem, which is the king of peace. The very name means king of of righteousness. He was a priest of the Most High God. He was greater than Abraham. He was without father. He was without mother. He was without descent. He had neither beginning of days nor end of life. And he was made like unto the capital S son of capital G God. So does anyone want to take a wild guess who Melchizedek is? Yeah, it has to be Jesus Christ. Now, if you think about that for a minute, so just think through this with me. So when when we see Melchizedek appearing, where is he? He's over right here with Abraham, right, in Genesis 14. But when is the Lord Jesus Christ born? Not a trick question, Matthew 1, right? So all the way over here. So what's going on right here compared to right here? Well, Let's just think through this for a minute. What Jesus Christ did at the incarnation is he took on human flesh at that time, right? He didn't have human flesh before that. But did God the Son exist 
before that. Had to have, right? In Genesis 1, what does God say? Let us make man in our image, meaning who was there? Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says that who was it that created everything that there is? Lord Jesus Christ. So before time, you know, he was over here, I guess, created everything. There was a moment in time where he took upon himself human flesh. Well, between here and back here, which is 4,000 years, was he doing nothing? Or were there things that he was doing? There were things that he was doing, and I would suggest one of those things he was doing is he was Melchizedek. He appeared unto Abraham and received tithes of him and blessed him. Same thing with what we read in the book of Daniel. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are cast into the fire, who's there with them? It's Jesus Christ prior to him taking upon himself human flesh. Get with me Genesis 32. So I would suggest to you, based upon all that, that Melchizedek is a Christophany. He's a manifestation of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, obviously, before the Lord took upon himself human flesh. Now, once you think through that, you might think, well, okay, if, if Jesus Christ appeared as Melchizedek, in Genesis 14, which it seems like he did. And if he appeared in Daniel chapter 3 in the, the fiery furnace, then you might wonder, well, is there anything else that he might have done during that time? Get with me Genesis 32. Genesis 32. So Genesis 32 and verse 22. And he, this is a reference to Jacob, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. Now notice this. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So this is where Jacob has this all-night wrestling session. Now, verse 24 says he wrestled with a man. Let's keep reading. Verse 25. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou blessed me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Why is that? For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Now notice verse 29. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. Notice the response. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? So Jacob is wrestling with a man. He asks him his name, and the person he's wrestling with doesn't want to tell him his name for some reason. You know anyone that does that in the Old Testament? Well, let's keep reading here. And he blessed him there. Now notice verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Why did he call it that? For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So if you were to ask Jacob, who does Jacob think, who did, who did Jacob think that he saw? God. But didn't the earlier verse tell us that it was a man? Well, gee, I wonder who that is. I mean, who, who could it possibly be? I'll give you three options, okay? You get three guesses, right? The Holy Spirit, God the Father, or God the Son. Isn't it sort of obvious that it's God the Son, That what's going on here? 
So Genesis 32, I would suggest to you, is another instance where Jesus Christ, prior to him taking upon himself human flesh, appears in the Old Testament as a manifestation of himself. Who did Jacob understand he was dealing with? He understood he was dealing with God. Look with me at Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. And let's look at verse 13. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? So Joshua sees this this man with a sword drawn. He goes to him and says, Are you with us or are you with the other side? Notice verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, all caps, am I now come. So when this person answers, he says, I'm I'm captain of the host. What does the word host mean? Army. Army, exactly, right? It's not talking about a party. It's talking about the army of the Lord. So this is the captain of the host of the Lord. So keep keep Joshua, because we're coming back here, but get Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the who? The captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So what Hebrews 10 establishes is that Jesus Christ scripturally can be referred to as a captain, right? So in, go back with me to Joshua 5, when Joshua 5 talks about the captain of the host of the Lord, in my mind you really only have two options there. One is, you could say, it's Jesus Christ, because he's a captain according to Hebrews 2, and who ultimately is in charge of the Lord's army? Jesus Christ, right? The other option, it seems to me, you could say, is you could say that that's a reference to Michael, right? Because Michael's an archangel. If you think about Revelation chapter 12, when there's war in heaven in Revelation 12, who are the two sides that fight? Michael and his angels and Satan and his angels, right? So your two options in Joshua 5 are it's either the Lord Jesus Christ or it's Michael. So how do you figure out which one it is? Go back with me to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5, verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Now notice what happens next. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Now, how did that verse give you the answer? Yeah. So what does Joshua do? When this man tells him, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord, Joshua falls down and worships him. So guess who it is? It's not Michael. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2. We're coming back to Joshua, but get Colossians 2 and Revelation 19. Get Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and 
worshiping of angels. In other words, there's a specific Pauline command that tells you whether or not you should worship angels, and it says not to do it, right? You should only worship the Lord. In fact, you might, I won't turn there now, but do you remember when the Lord is being tempted by Satan? And what does Satan want him to do? Wants him to to worship him, and what does the Lord say? The Lord alone is who you should worship, right? I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but you might want to check that. Get with me Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 9. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Verse 10, And I fell. Who's the I in verse 10? Excellent, yes. And I, I, John, fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So what you know from Matthew, what you know from Colossians 2, what you know from Revelation 19 is you should worship God, and it would be wrong to worship an angel, right? So let's go back to Joshua 5. When Joshua falls down and worships this being, who does it have to be? It has to be God. It can't be that he's worshiping an angel such as uh, an angel or an archangel like Michael. Joshua 5.15 And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is what? Holy. Holy. Well, does that tell you something about whether this is an angel or whether this is God? Who is it that's causing the ground to be holy? It's the presence of God, isn't it? In fact, does that verse right there make you think of another passage? It does, doesn't it? Which one? Moses in the burning bush, right? So let's get that. Let's get Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, the person that's described here in verse 2 is called the angel of the capital L, Lord. So I I realize it's called an angel, but let's read on because we're going to get some additional information. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see, notice what it says here, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So who's, who's in the midst of the bush, obviously? <laughs> Has to be God, right? God's the one calling out of it. And said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, For the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. It's holy ground, it seems to me, because God is there. And that's what's causing it to be holy. In Joshua 5, when the captain of the host of the Lord says it's holy ground, why is it holy ground? Because God the Son is present there with him. Now notice verse 6, if you had questions at all about what's going on in Exodus 3, I think this resolves it. Moreover, he said... I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So obviously Moses is interacting with God there in the burning bush. So let's let's put that all together then. So 
we've seen Melchizedek appears unto Abraham as the king of righteousness, the king of Salem. He's made like unto the Son of God. Seems pretty clear that that is a, a manifestation of Jesus Christ. What happens with Moses and the holy ground? God calls to him out of the, the burning bush. What happens in Joshua 5? Well, Joshua 5, the captain of the Lord of, the captain of the host of the Lord appears unto Joshua. Uh, I, I, I skipped in, uh, in Genesis where uh, Jacob wrestles with the man and then says, I've seen God face to face. And then we saw in the book of Daniel that there's one in the fiery furnace made like unto the capital S son of capital G God. And only th I, don't, I don't know what else you do with that other than that's not just an angel. You know, that's not just a cherub or something like that. What those things are a reference to, they're a reference to the fact that before Jesus Christ took upon himself human flesh when he was born a, a, of Mary, he was active in the Old Testament and he manifested himself to his people at various different times. And so that's what I, I think is going on with Melchizedek and what I think is going on with those, those other folks. Uh, he was not up in heaven twiddling his thumbs. Um, to state the obvious, he created the whole universe. It's his. It's by him and for him. Does God interact with his creation? He does, doesn't he? Because he has purposes that he wants to accomplish. So hopefully that gives you some clarity on Melchizedek and some of the other manifestations of Christ in the Old Testament. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. We thank you for this assembly. We thank you for this assembly's faithfulness to the truth over many years. We thank you for their stand for the King James Bible. We thank you for their stand for the gospel, for their stand for dispensational truth. We thank you for all the saints that have traveled to be part of, of this conference. We thank you that the people have a heart for your word and they desire to be edified and to be established in the truth. We pray, Lord, during these crazy times in which we live, we pray that the church would have peace of mind, that the church would have assurance, because we know where we're going. We know that we're on the winning side of history. We know that there's really nothing that can happen on this earth that's really a meaningful problem for us. It's just inconveniences on the way to glory. So help us to always walk with confidence and joy and peace. Help us also to take advantage of the doors of utterance around us, that we might speak the gospel to those that need to hear it. We thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace. We give you all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.